Hello, and welcome to South Carolina State Library's virtual celebration of Children's Day Book Day. My name is Rebecca Antill. I'm the Youth Services Consultant for the South Carolina State Library. And I'm Caroline Smith. I'm the Inclusive Services Consultant here at the South Carolina State Library. And we are thrilled today to have Pat Mora with us to celebrate Children's Day Book Day. Pat Mora is an award-winning author of books for adults, teens, and children. She is a literacy advocate and a popular presenter on creativity, inclusivity, and book joy. Pat Mora also founded Children's Day Book Day, which is a celebration of children and reading that now takes place in libraries all across the country around April 30th. She started these celebrations back in 1996, which makes this year its 25th anniversary. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Well, I'm delighted to be with you. I'm just sorry I'm not with you in person. We are too. We hope you can make a trip down here to South Carolina very soon. So my first question for you is, would you like to tell our audience a little more about yourself and how did you get where you are today? Well, I was born in El Paso, Texas, which is a city right on the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, I grew up speaking English and Spanish. And uh, that may sound unusual unless you come from a family that speaks two languages. So even from the time I was a little girl, I could say hola or I could say hello. Uh, and I've always gone back and forth. Uh, I wish I spoke three languages. And I think the third one I would like to learn is Italian because Italian and Spanish are very closely related. Um, I was a teacher. Uh, I taught Spanish to everybody in a school, first grade to sixth grade, my first year of teaching. I taught high school. I taught middle school. I taught at the university. And then I became an administrator at the university. And then I decided I want to start to start writing full time. Wonderful. Well, I have a question for you. Since you mentioned being growing up bilingual, how did that shape who you are and how did it affect your habits with reading and writing? Well, I have to say my reading has been in English. I can read Spanish, but I, I am a big reader. My mother was a reader. I was a reader. I grew up going to the public library in El Paso, Texas. I was in the summer reading club. Uh, I've always loved reading. I don't think I ever go a day uh, where I don't read for pleasure. And so I'm always saying, I have a seven-year-old granddaughter named Bonnie, and I'm always saying to Bonnie, Bonnie, I want you to read every single day, every single day. Uh, so although I didn't, I took Spanish when I was in college, but my, my reading is primarily, I would say 99% of my reading is in English. I have published my books in both English and Spanish, but usually someone who's a real expert does the Spanish translation. I focus on the English. Wonderful, thanks for sharing. Um, I do have a, one question for you in Spanish because um, we do have a, a very quickly growing Spanish speaking population here in South Carolina. So would you mind if I ask you that now? Absolutely, I'd love for you to ask me that now. Okay, I'm gonna use a little of my Spanish. Okay. <laughs> es, es un placer tenerle aquí con nosotros. Desea enviarle un breve mensaje a las familias que hablan español aquí en Carolina del Sur sobre la importancia de leer con los niños y compartir sus historias con ellos. Me encanta estar aquí con ustedes. Es un placer. Y como estaba diciendo yo en inglés, y lo voy a decir especialmente para las madres, las padre, los padres, abuelitas, tías, es tan, tan, tan importante que los niños y que nosotros como adultos, ¿verdad? 
leamos todos los días. Yo tengo una nieta y le digo yo todo el tiempo, quiero que leas todos los días. Es un placer, no es una tarea, es un placer. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pat. That was wonderful. So I feel like that leads right into um, what is Children's Day Book Day and, and why is it so important to you and why the switch, if you will, from the focus on DIA to a broader Children's Day Book Day? Great question. Thank you for the question. So I was speaking uh, really about my adult poetry at the University of Arizona 25 years ago when um, the person doing a radio interview, so interviewers are very important. The person doing the radio interview after I spoke happened to be bilingual and happened to be from Mexico. So she said, when we finish the interview, would you read some of your books that are bilingual in Spanish? And I'll record it. So I said, well, I'd be happy to do that. And then when she and I were chatting, she said, well, you know, I'm gonna play the, these books in Spanish for Dia del Niño. I'd never heard of it, you know, and I had grown up on the border. And I said, well, what is that? And she said, oh, it's Day of the Child on April 30th. Well, then I started doing some research and many countries have a Day of the Child. And I thought, well, why doesn't our country have that? I mean, we value children. So I decided that I would start that. And I was with a bunch of librarians and I said, well, what do you say? What if we do the first Children's Day, but we're gonna do Children's Day Book Day. And so being good librarians, they got some uh, pencils and some you know, treats for the kids. And so we started it 25 years ago. Since then, it has grown and grown. Now, we don't know this, most of us, but hundreds of languages are spoken in the United States. And you can go to Google, that's where I got that back, because I certainly didn't know it. Hundreds of languages are spoken in the United States. So I got to thinking, well, Although I love saying El Dia de los Niños, El Dia de los Libros, Children's Day Book Day, it's really important to me that every single child in this country feel this is their day. Now, Children's Day Book Day, every day of the year is Children's Day Book Day, every day of the year. But April 30th is the big celebration, and I hope that means some treats for our girls and boys around the country. So now I more and more say Children's Day Book Day uh, because even here, I now live in New Mexico and even here in New Mexico, I got to thinking that when the schools did El Dia de los Niños, El Dia de los Libros, well, what about the boys and girls that come from the different reservations? Do they, I don't want them to feel that this isn't their day. It's every child's day, just like we feel about Mother's Day and Father's Day, right? Every mother feels that's their day. Every father feels that's their day. The difference is that Children's Day Book Day is every day of the year, every day of the year with big celebrations, April 30th. So what would you like to see libraries do to celebrate Children's Day Book Day? What's like, if everybody could do one thing. You mean uh, on or near April 30th? Yes, Because I want them to do it all year long. Every day, yes. Yeah, but for the celebration, well, I think, you know, to be honest, kids like treats, right, boys and girls? Kids like treats. So I would like, and I have seen all kinds of celebrations. But usually you want to have a book time and treats. Now I have seen fancy celebrations where it's all day, they have games, they have games involving books and prizes. Uh, they do all kinds of fun things that involve books instead of toys. 
But I'm, uh, what I want is that every library, every school, every child care center, every home celebrates something special on April 30th. Just to remind us, just like Mother's Day and Father's Day, even though we celebrate it one day of the year, it says, oh, you know, have I been taking good care of mom? Have I been giving my dad big hugs? That's what I want for Children's Day Book Day. Wonderful. I have a question for you now. Um, what would you suggest for parents who can't read with their kids, either because they don't know English and aren't comfortable reading a book in English, or because they never got comfortable and built those literacy skills themselves? We still see that a lot. How can they still encourage their children to build a love of reading and share their stories with their kids? That's another great question. And I, I have a story that I tell a lot. It's a true story that um, I was visiting. It may have been a lot, it may have been a school actually in Texas. Um, it may even have been a teacher conference where they had, you know, teachers and librarians and students. But I happened to see a dad. Re take his little girl, could have been a dad, could have been a granddad, and he had her read to him. I knew that he did not speak English, but he was so proud of her, and he was giving her one of the biggest gifts that we give any child, our time our attention. And he was so proud of her. So he didn't hear, he couldn't translate every word, but he knew that his little granddaughter was reading in English. And he even got teary. That's why I remember the scene so much. He was so proud of her. And sometimes I think grandparents, aunts, uncles, even mom and dad forget how important we are in the lives of our children. We're important to them. And I have to say aunts and uncles too, because I had an aunt in my life who is just one of the key people. Uh, and I have written and written and written about her. So aunts and uncles are part of this too. As an aunt, that's great to hear. It's very important. I was just gonna say the same thing. That's what I always <laughs> give to all of my nieces and nephews as, as gifts. Lots and lots of books and lots of time spent reading. Well, that's it. You know, I know for my granddaughter, she loves to talk to us, but I have a daughter who's her aunt and, and, and that's a very, very important relationship in her life. So aunts, and, and that one aunt was in mine. Nice, that's really neat. Um, so uh, we've danced around the answer to this a little bit already, but why is it so important to share stories with children? I think when we share, we're, without saying the words, saying to a child, you are important. I'm going to take my time. I could be lifting weights, but I'm going to take my time and I'm going to sit here with you and I'm going to do something that I think is special. And so I think when I hold that book or when I have the child read to me, like with my granddaughter, I am saying to her, this is important to me and to you. This is a bond that we have. This is a connection. And in a way, it's sort of like when we cook with a child, right? I mean, that's great fun. Grandparents, aunts, uncles love to cook with their children. And we're taking in usually treats, right? Cookies or whatever. But the difference is with books, you know, what we are sharing is not only information, but a love of reading. And that is a life changer. I mean, we think what has happened this year with the pandemic, and I would be willing to bet a lot of money that the people who are readers have had a support that people who are not readers have not had, right? 
when you are a reader, you're never totally lonely because you can pick up a book and enjoy it and really enjoy it. Thank you, Pat. So leading into what was one of your favorite books as a child? Well, when I was a little girl and I loved to read, I told you that I had a mother who was a reader. So I had this book. I want to be sure you can see it. It's called The Childcraft. And my mother bought us this set of books and it had all kinds of wonderful pictures inside. They were black and white pictures, you know. And when I was homesick, I loved this book. This isn't the one I had then, but I bought one about 10 years ago just so that I could have it. The other thing I really loved when I was little, so I loved nursery, nursery rhymes. You know, I loved all the old nursery rhymes, but I also loved Nancy Drew books, the Nancy Drew mysteries. I love that. And then when I discovered Little House on the Prairie, Oh my gosh, I read all of those books. I went to the library and checked all of those books out. That's fabulous. That's so funny that Childcraft was the one that you brought up. That was one of my mom's most favorite books. And she was just it? found a copy a few weeks ago that she was absolutely thrilled with. Both, both of my grandparents had them at their houses. And I remember sitting on the sofa with, with both sets of grandparents at different times reading out of that set of books and they were they were spectacular. Uh, good, good. So Pat, would you be willing to share something that you've written with us, either part of one of your books or a poem that you've written? I'm going to do two short ones because we've been talking about books right now. I hadn't thought about this one, but this is a poem called Books and Me. We belong together, Books and Me, like toast and jelly, or queso y tortillas. Delicious, delicioso. Like flowers and bees, birds and trees, books and me. It's called Bravo Hip Hop Book Day. I like Mother's Day and Father's Day. Okay, making presents, baking cookies. Oh, yay. But April brings our day, ole. Kids and Books Day, ole. Bravo, our hip hop book day. Savoring a book buffet, I become a book gourmet. Sampling books on display, I turn the page and fly away in wordplay. So why delay? Why wait to read someday? Let's read books, borrow books, buy books, make books, create a eh? kids and books every day. Bravo, our hip hop book day. Ole. I love how celebratory those poems are <laughs> to get kids excited about reading. I have a question though, uh, where can we find those poems? If we want to go back and read them, are they in one of your collections? Well, thank you for the question. Yes, they are in Book Joy, Word Joy. And you know, I write the words, I don't do the art. Um, and I feel very, very lucky. I've had wonderful, wonderful illustrators. Raul Colon illustrated this book. He has illustrated a number of my books. And it might be interesting to know that the author doesn't necessarily decide who is going to illustrate the book. Um, usually the author and the editor look at a lot of artwork. And it used to be that that would have to be, you know, people would, an editor would mail me copies. Now with the web, the editor and I can both look at art by different illustrators, even illustrators in different countries. Certainly not all of my books have been illustrated by someone in the United States, but that is, uh, that's really exciting. I have a new book coming out next fall and the illustrator, again, I haven't met her, but she's very young, she's just starting out. And so that's exciting too. 
Yeah, you get to give someone who's new an opportunity. That's really great. I'm happy about that. And the name of that one is My Magic Wand. And it is really a lot about my granddaughter. And in fact, the illustrator put my husband and I in the book. So yeah, when you read the book, you'll actually see me with my granddaughter. It's mostly about her, but it's kind of fun. Yeah. <laughs> Now, did you write that this past year over the pandemic or was it uh, already finished? It, it was already written because, you know, it take, an illustrator gets plenty of time to do the artwork. I'm excited about this book because, as I mentioned, it's a new illustrator. So her name is Amber Alvarez and she lives in Utah. We haven't met, but I'm hoping that sometime we will. That's always fun to, to get to meet the illustrator. I don't always, yeah. One That's of exciting. my books, I'm trying to think of which one, one of them was illustrated by an illustrator who lives in the Orkney Islands. Chances are I won't meet her. <laughs> <laughs> but it would be fun if you got the chance. Oh, oh it's always a great moment, yeah. <laughs> um, so the next question that we wanna ask is, um, how have your views on reading and books been affected by the pandemic? Did you, did you write it all last year? Did you find yourself reading more instead? How did that all work out? Well, these are wonderful questions. I tend to be at my desk pretty much nine to five. I mean, I do stop and have lunch with my husband, but he's a retired professor and so we both tend to spend a lot of time at, my, at our desks. Uh, I don't think the pandemic affected my schedule at all. Uh, it meant we didn't get to go out and eat. That was a big change because we like to do that some. And we didn't get to see our granddaughter. I, didn't, I have three grown children. That's been hard. Uh, my oldest is a son and he's actually been here the last few months. Uh, with a friend. And so it's been nice to see him. That, that has been a hard part. I'm very close to one sister. and But we have FaceTime, but it's not the same. You can't hug them. Yeah, I think that's that's been the hardest part for, for most people. But I think for readers, this is just a guess, that for readers, the pandemic has not been as hard as for non-readers. I realize people have watched a lot more screens, but this is just me. I don't think a screen compares to me and my book. Those are totally different. They, they are. Uh, I would tend to agree with you as well. And I think a lot of the research shows that there's, there's a distinct difference between reading a physical book in your hand and reading on a screen, especially with children. Oh, how interesting. I did not know that. Oh. And I, I believe that we would really like for you to read one of your books next. Here is Book Fiesta. And I, love that one. I think that you all are going to hear that in English and Spanish. And I had a great time recording that. That's beautifully, beautifully illustrated. And it was great fun to write. I think one of my favorite pictures is the one of the giraffe. I can't, I've never been brave enough to get in a hot air balloon and I can't imagine being up there with a balloon. Uh, so I like, I like that book a lot. Uh, another one that might, we, we might just sample is I did a book of haiku. And many teachers like to have students try writing haiku. And I, one time I was visiting a class. Um, it might have been someplace in the South. Um, it, and a young, I was talking about the book and, you know, that I'd written this book called Yum, mm, Que Rico, uh, America's Sproutings. And it's about a book, uh, plants, all kinds of growing things, fruits, vegetables that are native to the Americas. And then I wrote haiku about them. So maybe I'll read one about something that most boys and girls like, which is peanut butter. And it's called peanut 
smear nutty butter, then jelly, gooey party, my sandwich and me. For those of us who love peanut butter, but I know sometimes there are boys and girls who are allergic to peanuts, so I think maybe I should do another one. How about cranberry? I love cranberries. And this is called, so it's called cranberry, marsh floating hard bead, simmers then pops in hot pot, scarlet fireworks. Well, that's a good word to look up if you don't know it, marsh, right? What's a marsh? But I was talking about this book in a class and I think they were maybe fourth graders. And so I said, well, do you all want to try writing haiku? And so I said, five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables. And there was this little African-American boy in front. And I'm telling you, as soon as I would say go, he would just scribble, scribble, and he'd say, I'm finished. And he wrote haiku after haiku. I have never forgotten that boy. It was terrific. So it's a fun thing to do. Hi, writing haikus can be fun. And they make it really, really can be. they write, make you really compress, right? Because you only have five syllables. So pretty soon you say, well, I don't need the, and I don't need a, and I, you, you begin to compress. So it's a good exercise. So when you were choosing haikus for this book, are they all about like your favorite foods, your favorite recipes, or did they just kind of come out of thin air? Well, this is a good time to talk about an author working with an editor. So editors are the people who um, are hired by the company that who is go that's going to publish the book. If somebody publishes the book, I don't. And that means somebody spends their money, right? They're paying me. They're paying the illustrator, they're paying editors. The job of the editor is to make sure that the book holds together well. And of course they want good reviews. That's what editors need. So my editor's name was Louise May and she just retired and she and I did many books together. So when we were picking books, when we were picking foods, for yam mm, que rico, we were thinking about what are the foods native to the Americas that would be fun to do in this book. And then she came up with the great idea that we should have on the page some information. So when we talk about potatoes, we also give you a little bit of facts about potatoes that's the kind of thing as an author, I probably don't go there, but that was a time when Louise said, well, don't you think that would be fun? I think the students and certainly the teachers and librarians would want that. So it's a, it's a team that puts together a book. When you're at home and you're writing your own book, you may ask mom and dad or, for advice, but your teacher wants this to be your project, you're doing it by yourself. And I did that for many, many years. But now when a book is published, somebody spends their money <laughs> to publish that book. And so there's going to be a team putting that book together. So the new book is on its way to the publisher. Even if I wanted to change something now, I couldn't. It, it, is, it is being published. We look forward to reading it. Well, I, I'm because it's about my darling girl, I hope you enjoy it. That's fun. Um, we at the State Library, we love the connection between food and literacy. Um, it, uh, we've talked about this before, I think, um, in your conversations, but we have a food literacy initiative at the State Library, South Carolina Read, Eat, Grow. And we talk about the story of food, how it gets to your plate. Um, what does healthy cooking and meal preparation look like? Um, how can we think about our food in a more sustainable um, cultural space? Um, and, and that's one of the reasons that, we've, that we wanted to work with you this, this year, um, because 
of the way that you incorporate food and literacy together in a lot of your your stories. Was that on purpose when you do that is or was it just sort of something that that happened you know like with the haikus why food why not animals well i would say do send me a link to that initiative because i would love to promote it i feel very strongly about that i don't think when i pick a topic i am going from here to my hand, I think I'm going more from my heart to my head. Um, so I don't think I'm strategic necessarily. I'm picking something that I love, you know, and if you look at, at some of my books, you will see that. Um, uh, my husband study, as I said, is a professor and he studies water all over the world. So one of my books is actually focused on water and it was a great pleasure to do that book. And the illustrator for that book is the one who lives on the Orkney Islands and she did a beautiful job. So this is the book, Water Rolls, Water Rises. El agua uh, rueda, el agua sube. And it, she just did, I mean, she's an amazing illustrator, just an amazing illustrator. So it's all about water around the world. So in that case, it's just me, the topic, and just letting myself use my imagination. And I think boys and girls, I, I, speaking particularly to boys and girls, this is also for teens and adults, but you wanna give yourself time on the page, and I have some poems about that, time on the page to just have fun. Uh, I, I am a former teacher, so I know my students probably didn't think my assignments were a lot of fun. But I do think that when, when I give myself time to write, and I give myself time to write, it, that's my assignment, you know, other than Children's Day Book Day, writing is my number one assignment after family. Family is the number one assignment. And then after family, you know, it really is writing and children's book day. Um, and I feel incredibly lucky that I can do that, you know, and I couldn't do it if I hadn't been a reader. So I'm going to go back to that. You know, uh, I, I think it's be very hard to find a writer who wasn't a reader possible, but not many. So Pat, what is hard about a writer or is it hard to be a writer? Well, writing is something I love to do, but I think back to when I first started, not just in school, but when by myself, and that was probably more than 50 years ago, um, when I decided I was going to spend time writing. And writers have to spend time alone. So it is hard to really write your best if there's a TV on in the room, you know, you need to have quiet. If maybe that means you go to a bedroom you share with your sister and you ask your sister to leave the room and you're there by yourself. I think writers need quiet. And then you have to have faith in yourself. You have to sort of pat yourself on the back. Nobody else is probably going to do that. Maybe a good teacher occasionally. But when I work on a book, I work by myself for many months and I just have to believe that I'm using my time wisely and that maybe someday somebody is going to hold the book. Maybe it's going to be a teen, maybe it's going to be an adult, maybe it's going to be a child. I write for all ages and I'm hoping that what I write is going to make somebody happy or is going to teach them something or is going to be a good companion. But writing is not necessarily easy. Um, 
But you know, learning to ride a bike isn't easy either. So most of the things we, we really do in life won't be that easy. But the more you do, the more you do it, the better you get. Great advice for any aspiring riders that are listening. Including adults. All right. Well, since we're here to celebrate Children's Day Book Day, I wanted to ask you, what can families do today? What's one thing they can do with their kids to celebrate reading and children? Well, one of the things I've been suggesting is sort of a what I've called a triple treat. Because, you know, this year during the pandemic, not all children may be at school and maybe you work at a library or at a child care center. So the triple treat is read a book, draw a picture, have a treat. You have to have the treat. You know, that's the most, well, I won't say it's the most important for me, it's the third, but it is to, to read a book together. And I think for families to read together, it can be hard today because people feel that what we do together is we watch a program together. And that's why it's not that I don't enjoy television, but I will tell you, I do not watch much. And so that probably means you think I'm weird, but uh, I, like, I like to walk outside. You know, I really love the outdoors and uh, I love to read and I love family. So I think TV is a nice pastime, but it is not central to my life. Libraries are important. Thank you again for being here with us today and sharing your stories with us and your encouragement for young writers and getting started and for all the work you've done in the past 25 years to promote the celebration of Children's Day Book Day. Well, you're helping me by promoting it. So thank you, thank you, thank you to South Carolina. Thank you, Pat. It's been wonderful chatting with you today. Thank you all.